I really want to thank our panelists for coming today, some as far as this boulder and, and some as close as Crested Butte. And uh, without further delay, I'll introduce our moderator, Dr. Kate Clark. She teaches in EMBS and MEM and sociology and honors and does all sorts of other great things for Western. So a warm thanks to Kate Clark. with it, 
Judy and Larry normalize resistance to that power. Perhaps most importantly, they helped us find our power. Many of those activists continue to protect the land and people of Appalachia, while others have scattered and continue to work in other places. But that practice of resistance that we learned from Larry and Judy lives on. Their ability to see injustice and to act with clarity and courage offers me a model for how to try my best to live responsibly in dark times. When we finally do end mountaintop removal, it will be because of Larry and Judy, and much more importantly, they would say, because of the thousands of people they called to action. Before turning it over to our panelists today, I wanted to remind us of Aaron's call to look for each other, for strength and for the capacity for change. No one is coming to save us. It's up to us. And this isn't nearly as scary as it might otherwise be if we didn't look around our own communities and ce celebrate the Larrys and Judys that are still with us. On that note, I'm so pleased to introduce our three guests, Allie Melton, Zane Kessler, and Sam Weaver. And I'll say just a little bit about each before passing it over first to Allie. Allie received her bachelor's in political science from Colorado State University and her JD from the University of Colorado Law School. Since joining High Country Conservation Advocates in 2013, she's worked on public land issues in, in the surrounding Gunnison country, excuse me, you can go there if you like, uh, that include natural gas, coal, and timber. She also works to secure a permanent mine-free solution for Red Lady. Uh, Sam Weaver is a friend of mine, and I was so honored to be involved in his campaign for Boulder City Council in 2013. He's also the CEO of Cool Energy Incorporated, a clean energy equipment company located in Boulder, Colorado. And finally, Zane Kessler works with the Thompson Divide Coalition, and in doing so, leads a broad-based coalition of ranchers, sportsmen, local governments, and existing user groups working to conserve an area of pristine public lands and the heart of America's most visited national forest, the White River. With that, I'll turn it over to Allie. Thanks, Kate. program director for High Country <coughs> Conservation Advocates. So I'm located in Crested Butte, which is really close to here in Gunnison. And um, kind of like some of a lot of the issues <laughs> that I think a lot of us are working on or concerned about or engaged on, these efforts take a long time. Um, and Saving Red Lady is definitely one of those battles. So this is just uh, to help people get oriented on kind of what we're talking about. I think it's always good to have images and maps because it makes it so much easier to kind of conceptualize it. So this is Crested Butte at the bottom, and at the top is Mount Emmons, or Red Lady, as we locally refer to this mountain. Um, this mountain was proposed for molybdenum mining in the mid-1970s. We have kept it mine-free to date. Um, there has been historic mining on this mountain that has created acid mine drainage that we are still continuing to figure out how to address and how to clean up so we don't have heavy metal loadings into our creek. Um, but to date, we still do not have a mine, so I wanted to kind of walk through what are kind of the tools and what do I think helped our community and our valley stay mine-free for these 40 years. Um, so... This is what a big molly mine can look like. This is actually the Amax mine, um, which is just up on Leadville. So not too far from here. Um, the one that has been proposed at times for Mount Emmons has been proposed as an underground mine. This mine was originally an underground mine too, but then it collapsed and it became an open pit. So that is a very real reality when you're looking at proposed uh, underground mines as they can become open pit mines. And 
And um, right now we do not have an actual mine proposal on Mount Emmons, which is hugely historic. Um, but this is from the most recent mine proposal we have, just to kind of give you an idea of what we've been looking at. And you can see where Crested Butte would be, and you can see that the entire main part of Mount Emmons would be where you would have the mining activities, but it wouldn't be restricted just to that area. Large hard rock mining requires hundreds and thousands of acres, so you'd also be looking at having huge reservoirs and dams um, in what's called Elk Creek, which would be right here. And you would have a huge corridor area coming through what's called Splange Gulch and into the Carbon Creek Valley, which you can see from Gunnison pretty easily if you just go out Ohio Creek a little ways. It would be tucked up behind Carbon Peak in what right now is a pretty heavily used recreation corridor, beautiful valley. That would be all mine tailings dam waste. Um, so not pretty things you want to recreate in, and it definitely wouldn't keep the valley in the pristine nature it is now. And this is at the top of Red Lady. Uh, those are Red Lady prayer flags that uh, the organization I work for started creating, I don't know, <laughs> quite a few years back. And people will put them up in their houses, outside their houses, and on the top of Red Lady to show kind of a form of resistance in that we want to keep our mountain mine free. Um, and it's a sign of solidarity with a mine free Red Lady. And uh, this is just looking in Ohio Creek. So this is uh, looking at the castles. This would be one of the areas that would be really close to the proximity of where you would end up having a bunch of the mine waste being placed. And this is the Slate River. The Slate River, although on the other side, so the north side of Mount Emmons, um, would not be where a lot of the mine activities would be located, the mine would be requiring to take water out of the Slate River, taking it up and over, and putting it in a reservoir. So you would see a reduction in flow on the Slate River. Um, and so this is a picture of the Slate River flowing freely. So what have been the tools that this community has used to help keep Red Lady mine free? And when we're dealing with hard rock mining, we're dealing with the 1872 mining law. It is that old. And <laughs> so when you're dealing with such an archaic law, uh, then it becomes a real question of, well, what are all the different tools that we have? And thinking creatively of how you can use them in kind of a patchwork way to protect the resource you're trying to protect. And I think here, what really led to that was, I think, a very unified community vision for a mine-free Red Lady, keeping that mountain intact. Instead of having more mining in our community, addressing historic mining and moving away from a mining extractive community um, and economy, moving to what I think now is really that tourism recreation-based economy. You also have legal tools local regulations and economics that played a role. So when I really think about the community pieces, grassroots advocacy for protection I think is huge. Um, that can provide a way for people to speak up. It provides unity and standing up for something you care about and it makes, you know, you're not having to do it necessarily alone. Um, and we got that with High Country Conservation Advocates. We were founded in 1977 by concerned citizens that did not want Red Lady Mind. And they used the organization to mobilize and get information out to the public to share a vision of having our community stay mind free. And I think that that really played a large role in kind of helping move away from what had been the past of Crested Butte, which is an old coal mining town, and moving to what we are now. We, are, we really do have that new tourism economy and that really is what drives our economy. I mean, our summertime is the busiest, um, and that really kind of has allowed us to move away from extractive uses and to keep our public lands and our resources intact. 
So legal tools, um, as I mentioned, the 1872 mining law is really old. Under the 1872 mining law, it's everything is free and open for staking. So anyone here in this room could go out and actually stake a mining claim. It's pretty simple. There's some maintenance that you have to do annually for the claim. It's very nominal. Um, so when you're dealing with 1872, then it's like, well, what do you have that overlays it? Well, we do have modern environmental laws. So that's the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, which if you're concerned about any of these issues, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, is a huge piece because that allows you the opportunity to participate in public lands management. And that requires agencies to provide information to the public about projects and proposals to get comments, to respond to those comments, and to actually respond to them in a way that is productive and it actually addresses the concerns. Um, so that's a huge, huge piece. You're also dealing with you know, the Forest Service and BLM man management mandates. The BLM, for example, has a regulation that requires preventing undue and unnecessary degradation. That's a pretty nice little sentence there that can be used if you are trying to protect something and keep it intact. Um, and so you have kind of all those backstops at the federal level, but then you also have the states. We have the Division of Reclamation and Mine Safety, and we also have the Water Quality Control Division. So not only were we being prepared to engage at whatever federal opportunities we had, we also were engaging at the state level where opportunities presented itself. So for example, for the Water Quality Control Division aspect, um, because of the acid mine drainage, we have a permit for the discharge that comes from a water treatment plant that treats that drainage before it goes into Cold Creek. That allows an opportunity to engage and to kind of push for getting cleanup done, to push for having better standards on Cold Creek so it's more protective. And that's been something that not only HCCA, but the entire community has engaged with. Right now we're in a water quality regulation proceeding and we are um, signing on to statements with the town and the county as well. So it's a very collective, joint, unified effort as we move forward um, as well. Um, so just some very basic overviews too of some additional things we've worked on. If we have the water treatment plant that treats the acid mine drainage because of the Clean Water Act. So having that federal environmental law is what keeps our Cold Creek from running orange. It used to run orange. Um, in the 90s, we challenged a grant for conditional water rights. Those were the water rights that the company would need to take water out of the Slate River. And in the 2000s, we challenged uh, part of the mining law um, that would allow for the company to privatize some of their mining claims. And you know some other issues worked on too. Significantly, though, um, pretty much everything under that 1979 bullet point, we lost almost every single one of those issues legally. Um, but what we did get out of it, and this is, I think, something when you're an environmental activist or you're concerned about these issues, what you get is you're able to get forward progress. So, for example, one of the cases we lost at the state level. We did have the administrative law judge say, well, the division, the Water Quality Control Division, has authority to require bonding for the water treatment plant, so an operational bond, but they don't have to require it. That was really important, though, because we were fighting over whether or not they had the authority to bond. And that bond is important to keep that water treatment plant operating so we don't maybe have an accident. Um, and so what happened when the previous company started to kind of go under financially, the, the town and the county sent a letter to the state saying, hey, you guys might want to require a bond for this water treatment plant because we're really concerned about the company's financial status and we don't know if we're going to be able to count on them continue to operate that. Well, one thing led to another, Gold King happened, 
And we now have a new company with ownership up here, and they came to the table because they have previous liability under another federal environmental law, which we commonly refer to as Superfund. And they're now working to clean it up. And for the first time, we also have a company that says they have no intention to mine. So from that court case that we lost, we actually got a tool that we then used later down the road, and now we are looking at a finding this permanent solution that would withdraw the mining claims and prevent non eminents from ever being mined. So that's pretty big. So even when you have losses, sometimes you just got to take a step back, breathe deep, and then you reassess and you figure out how it plays in. And you don't let it defeat you. Because it's, it's not the end until it really is the end. Um, uh, so, very shortly, local regulatory tools don't overlook what you can do local as well. Not only can you work on getting state legislation done if you have a friendly state, um, state house, but you can also get things done at a county level and at a town level, and we did that here. We have, um, we got Gunnison County planning regulations and the land use regulations that would require if a company were to ever go through forward with a mine, to go through a county approval process as well, and we also have the Crested Butte Watershed Ordinance too. Um, so those are just kind of some extra protections that you're able to look at getting in place. And significantly, economics plays a huge role. Um, it, I, do, I do not think it's insignificant that the Molly market crashed in the late 70s and 80s, and shortly after the water treatment plant was put in place, then there stopped being interested in mining. Um, oh, there it is. <laughs> so, you know, and every time we see an uptick at all with the market some, before the, this current owner, we had seen the, the owners being interested in going forward with mining. We'd see a new plan of operations coming in, um, new energy to try to get something going. So that's something to definitely think about on any issue you work at on, is how does that big piece play in, and can you use it to your advantage, knowing that that's a lever out there? And uh, lastly, that is looking from down around CB South, back towards Mount Emmons, fully intact and mine free. Uh, with that, I will pass it on to our next speaker. Thanks so much. So we're going to start with just a quick little video about the Thompson Divide area, which is just that way um, in the Roaring Fork Valley at the confluence of the Roaring Fork and <laughs> Crystal Rivers. Thompson 
as modern ranchers, there's no question that we use oil and gas every day. We don't do everything strictly with a horse and a team and a wagon like they did 100 years ago. And without it, we would be kind of back in the stone age. We're not anti-oil and gas by any stretch. grew up on this ranch outside of Carbondale. It was my grandfather's. He got it somewhere around 1910. I've been here all my life. Our cows need good quality water to drink. We really worry about their future if oil and gas comes in. Thompson Creek is uh, is important to us because that's what we make our living in Thompson Creek. I know people has got to make a living and I'm not doing against that. If they go in there and drill it, they'll wreck it. They're just going to buy it up, coming out the window, so it's going to be up front. Economic impact can be tremendous mostly because Western ranches require these public lands to run their cattle on during the summertime. If that land's not there and it's fractured, then it basically puts these operations out of business. This area of Thompson Divides is not appropriate. The terrain is just too tough. We would destroy too many other values if we go in there with a system of roads. I run cattle on, on lots of places, but I don't try to run cattle everywhere. In the same light, I don't think it's appropriate to develop gas everywhere. There's just some areas where the cost of doing it outweigh the potential benefits. Thompson Five is one of those areas. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of what the aesthetic values that exist and the cultural values that exist in this area known as Thompson Divide. And before I go into more depth about that campaign and the work that we've done um, in the Roaring Fork Valley, I want to just start and, and give you guys a little bit of a primer of how we got here. Um, Teddy Roosevelt, arguably our nation's first conservation president, in his first address to Congress, um, in an attempt to justify the creation of the white, or of the national forest system, said, quote, some at least, um, Roosevelt said in his first address to Congress, quote, some at least of our, our forest reserves should afford perpetual protection to the native fauna and flora safe havens of refuge to our rapidly diminishing wild animals of the larger kinds, and free campgrounds for the ever-increasing numbers of men and women who have learned to find rest, health, and recreation in the flower-clad meadows of our mountains. Just a matter of months after that, he was able to get the Transfer Act of 1905 passed, um, but thereby creating the National Forest System. Just a few weeks after that, he got on a train and headed west. Um, from D.C. all the way to Glenwood Springs, where he got off the train and he went on a four-week bear hunt in the area known as Thompson Vibe today. At the headwaters of Thompson Creek, on his first night at camp, he wrote in his personal journal that the Thompson area is, quote, a great wild place where mountains crowded together in chain peak and tableland, all of the higher ones wrapped in an unread shroud of snow. Skip forward. Uh, 100 years, and that area is now the White River National Forest. It is the most heavily recreated national forest in the nation, thanks in large part to Colorado's ski industry, but also due to the <coughs> booming outdoor industry, um, not only on the western slope, but throughout the Rocky Mountain region. 
more people visit the White River National Forest than Yellowstone, Yosemite, and Grand Canyon combined every year. Um, the Thompson Divide is just a small little sliver of that area, but it's right in the, right in the heart of it all. It is the um, largest unprotected complex of roadless areas in the state. It's the three top big game management units in the state. Uh, collectively, game management units 42, 43, and 521 generate 20,000 big game hunting license sales every year. And that's, that's a big number, but the economic impacts of that, the secondary impacts of that for communities on our side of the mountain, um, Redstone, Carbondale, Glenwood Springs, Paonia, those communities rely on those hunters. They come in every year and they eat in our restaurants, they stay in our hotels, they buy groceries, they buy a lot of booze, which is kind of scary. Um, <laughs> but the economic impacts are real and they, they support livelihoods. Um, likewise, um, it, additional existing uses in the Thompson Divide area also support livelihoods, whether it be the fifth generation rancher who employ, employs 15 to 20 people on his ranch year round, or whether it's the hunting outfitters, some of whom you saw in the video, um, or the river guys, the, the fishing outfitters, the list goes on and on. So the Thompson Divide for us is an opportunity uh, for conservation. And we've had some great successes. But we, we got there by choosing a middle ground approach. Um, we are a coalition of strange bedfellows. We have ranchers and mountain bikers, um, Republicans and Democrats, Pitkin County and Garfield County two of the most opposite counties in the state, all sitting at the table saying this area is worthy of, of protection. Um, I'd like to go back to, before I make my next point, that original quote from Roosevelt. He didn't say all of our forest preserves should be preserved to, to provide perpetual protection. He said some at least, not all, but some. And so we took that, in, in the, we took that to heart as we started this campaign. And we, we said, it's not that oil and gas development can't occur anywhere. It's that it shouldn't occur everywhere. There are certain places that are far more valuable as they are than if they were developed for speculative oil and gas returns. That said, the threat of oil and gas was real in the area. Um, under the waning days of the Bush administration, uh, the BLM went on a full-on land sale and they went with what we've described as a lease first, look later approach to oil and gas development on public lands. And the 100,000 acres of lands in the Thompson Divide that were leased for development were in large part sold for the statutory minimum of $2 an acre. Two bucks an acre for some of the most pristine public lands that, that we all enjoy in Colorado. And so we took that middle ground approach that I talked about earlier. We went to industry first. We said, let us work with you. Let's figure out a way to, to resolve this so that we can protect this area for the ranchers, the mountain bikers, and the outfitters. Um, the industry said no. And so we continued down the path, and we organized. And for years, it was really just a volunteer, community-driven effort. Um, you know, some of my original founding board members spent their weekends in front of City Market getting petitions signed. Um, but that grew, and momentum grew, and ultimately they hired staff, um, me and a couple others, and we started writing grants, and we got out there and we found um, an opportunity to make our case, and we did that through three specific areas. Um, the first I'll mention is we knew this area was valuable, but we didn't have a dollar amount to attach to it. We also knew that the oil and gas leases in the area were speculative. Otherwise, they would have gone at competitive auction for a much greater number than $2 an acre. Um, to put it in contrast, leases on the Rhone Plateau sold for $10,700 an acre versus $2 an acre in the Thompson Divide. So we knew there wasn't a, a large industry priority for developing this area. So we went out and we found some economists in Denver. We said, how much would it take to give us a study that's defensible, that shows us exactly what hunting, ranching, fishing, and recreation in the Thompson Divide support. Um, we wrote grants, we sent out emails, we raised enough money to pay for the study, and it came back about a year later, and we found that the Thompson Divide, just those four existing uses, support 300 jobs and $30 million a year 
in recurring economic activity. And I know we live in a day and age when people throw around billions like they're millions, but for a small town like Carbondale or Redstone, $30 million a year is a big deal. Um, and 300 jobs is a game changer. So we, we had that and we, we ran it. We started getting it out in op-eds, we had people writing letters to the editor, we built an email list and just started blasting it out. Um, from there, now that we knew what the existing uses were worth, we went out and we hired some petroleum geologists using the same exact model. We um, wrote grants, we raised funds from whoever we could, and we went out and we found the best petroleum geologist we could find. Um, it's a woman in Denver who works for um, a variety of huge oil and gas firms. Um, her client list includes everybody from ExxonMobil to Halliburton and onward. Um, and we asked her to come in and give us a real third-party analysis of what is the potential return uh, for oil and gas development in this area. And she pretty much said, there's a reason these leases sold for two bucks an acre. And came to the conclusion that you would have to drill 60 wells with a 100% completion rate just to cover the costs of infrastructure. So just to cover the cost of building your roads and your pipeline connectivity and the access into this remote area of backcountry You'd have to drill 60 wells with 100% completion rate. Um, that's unheard of in the industry. Nobody drills 60 wells in a row without hitting a dry hole. So we took that and um, we ran with that as well. And the reason I tell you this background is because all of this, whether we knew it at the time or not, all of it helped to build a legal record for why this area <coughs> is worthy of conservation. And some of our, our governing environmental laws, um, like Ali mentioned, NEPA. Um, you know, NEPA is required to incorporate public comment and public sentiment. And so we submitted that in comments, along with HICA and with Wilderness Workshop and a handful of other environmental groups. Um, and we got the Obama administration to pay attention. And from there, we, we, we carried that torch forward throughout multiple NEPA processes and um, ultimately, our argument won the day. But oh, the last thing I'll say is we also did water quality analysis. Um, you know, my board of directors is made up largely of fifth generation ranchers and business owners in that area, and their water is their livelihood. And um, they needed a bulletproof vest. They needed to know that if for some reason we fail and they come in here and they drill this area, we need a baseline for what the water quality is, so that if anything is ever diminished, we have a point source for that pollution. And um, that was really important, and it, it gave the community some assurances that we know what our quality is, and if for some reason we lose, and you guys come in here and mess up our water quality, then um, we at least have some recourse. Um, finally, in conclusion, I'll, I'll just say that BLM, uh, in the waning days of the Obama administration, canceled the improperly issued leases in the Thompson Vine area. Um, that was a multi-year fight. The fight is still not over. Um, we're seeking legislation from Senator Bennett, which has been introduced, to permanently withdraw the area from all future leasing. Um, Congress can do whatever they want, and I, I don't have a whole lot of faith in Congress these days, but um, we're gonna keep beating the drum. We're gonna keep asking for permanent protection for as long as it takes. And uh, with that said, I'll just say, whatever you do, do it with everything you've got and, and just keep banging the drum. And uh, I think most often than not, if you keep a level head on your shoulders, you'll, you'll be able to succeed. And I think issues like Red Lady and Thompson Abide and a handful of others here just on the Western Slope provide evidence of that truth. So thank you for having me. I hope I didn't go over time. And uh, yeah. So I'm going to thank you for having a front range person come out and talk to you about what is definitely a front range issue, which is to say Excel Energy and the energy system that we have in this country and in this world. I want to begin by saying that I think that one of the greatest social injustices being perpetrated right now is how slowly we are moving off carbon-fueled electricity and onto renewable electricity. And it is socially unjust in two very important ways. One is regionally. 
We are the richest country on the planet. We need to fund getting off of this carbon habit that we had as quickly as we can because people in other countries that are much more poor than us are the ones that are gonna suffer from the extreme weather events, including particularly drought, which affects food supply. <clears throat> and the other way that this is a, a major injustice is it is a transfer of wealth from your generation to my generation. So in other words, <clears throat> the people who have benefited the most from the wealth that's generated by the carbon fuel energy system will be the ones who pass on and the ones who see the worst of these um, impacts will be people who do not enjoy the wealth nearly as much. So I just want to frame up my conversation in that it's got this much bigger frame to it. And then I'm going to tell you some history of the energy regulation here in Colorado. And in the theme of this session, which I think is brilliant, <clears throat> it's about how do you soldier on in the face of really tough opposition. I want to tell the success story that's in the past that helped get us to where we are in Colorado. I want to talk about the fight in Boulder and what is behind that fight, why it's important to us. And then I want to talk about where we need to go in the future. Deregulation and change the way that Texas saw change. Now who would imagine that Texas would be the state that we'd hold up as one of the renewable energy and electric competition leaders in this country, but it is, and I'll tell you more about that. So going back in time, <clears throat> at the turn of the millennium in 2000, activists started running bills at the legislature to create a renewable portfolio standard. That is a requirement that investor-owned utilities like Excel, that generates about 70% of the electricity in the state, would have to have 10% renewable energy by 2015. <clears throat> and they ran that four times at the <coughs> legislature, and every time they were defeated. And after the fourth time in 2004, they said, fine, we're taking it to the people. We'll see what the people of Colorado have to say about clean energy and energy choice. So imagine, at the time, Bill Owens was governor, and George Bush got elected that year <clears throat> to be president of the United States. And Amendment 37 passed 52 to 48, which launched this complete change in the way that energy has been handled in the state of Colorado because that 10% was meaningful, <clears throat> but it's not very meaningful. And Xcel Energy was able to, the requirement was it couldn't cost more than 2%. So if you put renewable energy on the Xcel system and it cost more than 2%, you had to stop. Well, by three years later, they were most of the way done with putting all the wind on the system they needed to get to 10%. So the legislature in 2007 raised the target to 20%. <clears throat> and, um, you know, that change that had come with the vote of the people made all the difference in the world at the legislature's willingness to consider doing that. And they did it because, again, there was the same 2% requirement, right? So now we're going to decarbonize our electric system by 20%, but it's not going to cost 2% more on anybody's bills. So that moved along pretty quickly. And then in 2010, came Bill Ritter was president, and he had run for office based on the new energy economy. Right, to decarbonize even further and to create economic wealth from the decarbonization. So it's flipping the, the argument on its head that always got made against clean energy that it costs more and that it killed jobs. Well, in fact, it creates a whole, whole bunch more jobs <coughs> um, than fossil fuel base does. So in 2010, a grand bargain was struck. And this grand bargain was Excel to shut down a bunch of small old coal plants early in exchange for taking the renewable portfolio standard to 30%, which they did. And in fact, they also brought in the munis and the co-ops at that point with a target of 10% renewables. And Excel Energy wanted this because they got to retrofit coal plants. Bonnie and Hayden, they got to retrofit and extend the life 30 and 40 more years for those two coal plants. <clears throat> now, is that a good bargain or not? It probably is in the long run but it shows the power of uh, the big investor-owned utility in the state to set the terms of these very important deals. And there's another one coming. So this is the first part of, of what I want to talk about is you see this progression, 2004, 2007, 2010, and then 2013, the, uh, <clears throat> the munis and the co-ops had their goal raised to 20%. So in Colorado right now, we're doing reasonably well, but nothing really has happened since 2013. And so a former chair, two former chairs, sorry, a former chair and a former member of the Public Utilities Commission working with energy activists have proposed a way to shut down more coal plants sooner in exchange for itself being able to own more wind generation. 
But typically, Excel has to get wind generation by bidding it out on the open market to keep the prices fair. But there could be a bargain made this year at the state legislature. It'll come down to the wire. It'll be like all of these things. It'll be a midnight deal that finally gets done if it happens. But the question is, is that a good thing? And I think the answer might be yes, even if it's unfair. Because the most important thing <clears throat> is to get the carbon out of the atmosphere as quickly as we can. It is totally critical, and anything that we can do to lead the way is an imperative for our state. So that election in 2004, those activists carrying the message to the people in the teeth of a million dollars spent by Excel to shut them down, <clears throat> they prevailed. And because they prevailed, they're the, the seed of this legacy that is us actually moving off of carbon at a decent rate. Not fast enough, we need more. But that's the success story I wanted to tell you about. <coughs> now I'm going to tell you about <coughs> the Boulder story. So around the same time, in the early 2000s, Boulder activists started getting really <coughs> aggressive about wanting to talk about how we're going to do something different with our energy system than the standard Excel franchise. Our franchise agreement, these agreements last 20 years <coughs> between the power company and cities, and ours was coming up in 2010. And so we wanted to have discussions well ahead of time because these are complicated things to plan. And so there was a push <coughs> in the 2007 and 2008 timeframe. You might get concurrent with what's going on at the state. There was a push <coughs> to get Excel to, to negotiate a new franchise agreement. And the, the taglines for this are democratize, decentralize, and decarbonize. That became the kind of slogan that Boulder started hanging its goals on. They develop more and more goals, but Excel, this is not their business model. They do not like this. Um, and so in 2009, they offered Boulder Smart Grid City. Right, so this was the grand bargain. We put in all this telecommunication infrastructure and we would get the grid of the future in Boulder. And in exchange for that, they wanted the discussion of the franchise agreement to stop. And so in seven and eight and nine, things didn't really move along very fast. There was a pay to play requirement for vendors who wanted to be on the system. And pretty much none of the promises of Smart Grid City were realized. And then Excel took the entire bill for Smart Grid City, went to the Public Utilities Commission, and said, we want to put this in rates. And the PUC let them put over half of it in your rates. So anybody, not you probably, but anybody who's on the Excel system is paying for this terribly mismanaged failed experiment, which managed to distract Boulder for a few more years. But then 2010 came. The franchise agreement came up. <coughs> voted the people, voted it down, said we do not want a new franchise, we want to be out of franchise until we can get what it is that we want. And then because of this, the council at the time, I was not on the council for any of this, the council at the time started listening and, and thinking about ballot initiatives for 2011. And so a group of us got together and said what can we do, I mean this group existed before me and power our future. And they had been pushing this effort all along. And as I had started my renewables and efficiency company, I had started to see how screwed up the laws were around who could generate and what the requirements were and who couldn't and who could sell to each other and who couldn't. Basically, nobody can in Excel territory except Excel. So a group of us got together and said, we want to model this future. So some of the strategies that you heard the other two talk about you know, they're important strategies. The economics is important, and the carbon emissions is important. And if you don't have your facts straight, if somebody doesn't put together some numbers, then it's just all one side, the other side, and nobody knows who's right. <clears throat> so we got a group of about 20 of us together, and one retired Hewlett Packard engineer, and a piece of software that can model energy systems. And we modeled and modeled and modeled, and we decided that we could get to 65% emissions reduction for no more cost than Excel, partly because there's no profit motive in there. So that was one big piece of the message we took out on the campaign trail. Ken Regelson and I debated Excel publicly eight times in the lead up to that election. And the first two of those were some of the most fun I've ever had because they had no idea what was coming. They hadn't seen the graphs, they hadn't seen the numbers, and so we could show charts, we could show the in-rail modeling tool that we used to get this out, and the, you know they looked like fools at first. But then they got better, and then they picked up their arguments. And so it came down to the election in 2011, and it came down to about midnight. We were all watching, and we were behind all night, 2B and 2C. The municipal 
measures which would fund $2 million a year <coughs> to explore the legal work that we would have to do at the Public Utilities Commission to, to divorce Excel. And um, one of them passed by about 150 votes, and we didn't know until we woke up the next morning. But that was, for us, a great victory at being able to say, our community wants this enough that we're willing to take a chance with funding this uh, going forward. And so, <clears throat> democratize means local decision-making input, right? Right now, who makes all the decisions? The Public Utilities Commission makes all the decisions. And that is an arcane process. It's very hard for citizens to get involved with. I want to give a shout out to Leslie Lustrum, an energy activist who has been going down to the PUC for a decade now and, and pointing out to them the direction our energy system needs to go. So democratize means if we become a municipal utility, then it's the city council who is accountable to the people, not the PUC, who nobody knows where they're located or how they work. The second is decentralize. We believe in the value of distributed generation. It's less transmission that has to get built. It's fewer central coal plants or even central wind plants that have to get built. Distributed generation <clears throat> should be done everywhere it can, and the local distribution systems should be made uh, robust to so being able to put as much DG on as we can get on. That obviously breaks the central utilities business model, and is one of the reasons that they're so opposed to this. And the last is decarbonize, and you've already heard my take on that, but um, we want to go even faster, and we believe we can go even faster if we were not locked into an Excel system. So we don't know where this is going. So it's an interesting time for me to be telling you this story because we've been fought tooth and nail at the PUC. Every procedural thing that could happen. They went and filed an application in Excel before we did, right, to try and force us not to file the application we wanted to file by getting summary judgment, and they got it. Then we challenged that in district court. We were overruled. District court supported them. Um, they challenged our right to form a utility in court. They lost, <coughs> and they went to an appeals court that overturned the lower court. So now pretty soon, Excel and Boulder are going to be at the Colorado Supreme Court fighting over we, a municipality, have the right to do this. The right is in the Colorado Constitution. It is not a statutory right. It is a constitutional right that we can do this. And so <coughs> for us to be having to fight so hard for this, is really an existential question. Does this right exist, right? Can another city actually become its own energy provider as provided in the state constitution? Or is the process so hard that that right fundamentally doesn't exist? And if it's the latter, then what are our choices, right? There's fighting at the PUC, but this is where I wanna go thinking about plan B. But I'll tell you one more thing. We're in the middle of this fight, meaning they've also made settlement offers. And they've made them before. <clears throat> and in this case, and I've, I've sat through this before, in 2013 I was part of a task force where we debated, you know, what, what could Excel offer of its own accord to Boulder? And now there's been a year's worth of secret negotiations, <clears throat> and there's another offer coming forward. And it's really not much different than the previous ones. It's got some more words, and some more pages, but the principles all adhere to the principles of vertically integrated, regulated, monopoly utility. And so, if this constitutional right doesn't actually exist, then how do we go forward in the future? Well, the future of the energy system, as I said, should look like Texas. So back in the days of the Enron scandal, a bunch of people got very angry at Enron in Texas. And so they said, what are we going to do with our energy system now? The five-person public utilities commission said, we are going to make the provisions to, to make this a competitive electrical system. And so they said, you guys have seven years. You know, all you investor in utilities that own generation, you better start planning ahead because we're going to take over the transmission system. We're going to run it as an ISO, which is a quasi-governmental body, and then you can bring on whatever makes the most sense as far as generation. And that's why there's so much wind in Texas, is all this wind energy is cheaper than coal these days. The wind blows like crazy in West Texas, and they built all this transmission out there. So the, the rate of adoption of renewable energy in Texas rivals that of California because they made their system competitive and people, end users, businesses, and, and individuals can choose who they want their supplier to be. And that, they're choosing the cheapest electricity, they're choosing wind. 
And so I believe that that future could be the future for Colorado. <clears throat> I think it would be useful and good for us to have a conversation because when we shut down coal plants, we will have made a promise to the investor in utilities to the generation and transmission people when they were approved that these can last for a certain length of time. And when you shut them down, as you should, they have to be paid for. It's called stranded assets. And so the question is, how do you pay for stranded assets? Well, it's going to be rate payers. So how do you do that? You put it into the transmission system. You say, OK, all these coal plants, the four or five left that we're going to shut down, we're going to pay you the utility and the GNT back for your investment in that over time with slightly higher transmission rates. But now you're going to have to be competitive. Now generation is going to have to competitively bid onto the grid, and they have to go find their customers who are going to pay for them. So these are fallback positions that I think we need to take steps that move us along to that kind of position so that we can decarbonize our system more quickly and democratize it and have people have more say, whether it's saying who your generation is going to come from, whether you want to look at how much carbon gets emitted from the people you buy from, shouldn't you be allowed to do that? So I'm going to tell a final story here to close. <clears throat> I was on the panel, a panel like this, for the Colorado Solar Energy Industries Association. And there were some municipal utilities on the panel that had broken free of their GNT. <clears throat> and there was the head policy person from Excel Energy. Her name's Alice Jackson. <clears throat> She's a smart lady. Um, and the person moderating the panel used to be the head of the Public Utilities Commission, Ron Benz. And so he turns to Alice Jackson and he says, Alice, this is near the end of the panel. There's all this distributed generation coming onto the grid right now. <clears throat> and we know that that doesn't really work in your business model very easily. So what is your approach to dealing with all this distributed generation? And she looked at it, there's a room full of solar installers, 200 of them, and all they want to do is change the world, right, and, and do the right thing. And she said, everybody here has to understand that we have a business, and so we're running a business, and we have a revenue requirement. And everybody's going to have to operate within that revenue requirement. So Ron Vins turns to me and he goes, Sam, you make distributed generation equipment and you're on the Boulder City Council that's in a big fight with Excel. What do you think? And I said, this is an existential question for the utilities, right? <clears throat> because if you go to somebody and say, you could put this distributed generation in your house and it would reduce your energy bills, but you're not going to be allowed to do that because the incumbent utility has a revenue requirement that you need to provide, people get angry. People think about that and they're like, that doesn't seem fair that I get held locked into the system when I could do something that would reduce my bills. And so it was not expected, but it was an applause line. So a lot of people clapped at that. And I, I realized, you know, partly through that, that there could be legs under this idea, but it may take a very long time for us to get there. It may take years. So I'm going to close with a reading from a book. This book is called Learning to Die in the Anthropocene. The Anthropocene means the, the world as formed by humans. Basically, the change in the climate and the change in, in you know, the biosphere that we are bringing about. And this book is written by a guy who's a, a veteran of the Iraq War. And so he came back and he's now at the Divinity School. But it's a powerful book, powerful perspective. The greatest challenge the Anthropocene poses isn't how the Department of Defense should plan for resource wars, whether we should put up seawalls to protect Manhattan, or when we should abandon Miami. It won't be addressed by buying a Prius, turning off the air conditioning, or signing a treaty. The greatest challenge we face is a philosophical one, understanding that this civilization is already dead. The sooner we confront our situation and realize that there's nothing we can do to save ourselves, the sooner we can get down to the difficult task of adapting with moral humility to our new reality. Carbon fuel capitalism is a zombie system, voracious but sterile. The aggressive human monoculture has proven astoundingly virulent but also toxic, cannibalistic, and self-destructive. It is unsustainable both in itself and as a response to catastrophic climate change. Thankfully, carbon fuel capitalism is not the only way humans can organize their life together. There's more like that. It's really powerful. And so I thank you all for taking the time.
have just a, about five minutes for some questions. So it looks like Dr. Hausdorfer is walking around with a microphone. I don't really need a microphone. Uh, That's okay, I'll give it to you anyway. Okay. Uh, my question is for you, ma'am. I'm sorry, I forgot your name. I apologize. Uh, Allie. Allie. Uh, what is it that's keeping these companies from drilling or digging or finding some new creative way to mine that, that mountain? Well, right now, um, what it is is uh, the, the current owner now um, has liability under Superfund for the historic acid mine drainage. And because of the way that law is, if that mountain were to ever be mined, you can't really do hard rock mining without generating more acid mine drainage. So you'd look at having the liability increase. They're interested in decreasing their liability. And so that's why now for the first time ever, we have a company saying, we have no intention to mine. They pulled an existing plan of operations, for example, uh, I think last fall that had been out there sitting for a few years, they pulled it and they said, no, we're not going to do that. And I think it's really because of that, that liability aspect. Thank you. So federal environmental laws doing what they should do. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, I guess I have one. Do you think that tax they're collecting and put the, put the mining rights to bid is collecting enough? Are they somehow are, are things going slower than you thought they would for the putting the rights to bed? It's a good question. Um, so just a little bit of background. The town council last November um, put on the ballot initiative to transfer $2.1 million from the land transfer excise tax that we have um, collected. It's like a real estate tax that's to go to our open lands, open space. and. $2.1 million now, because it was passed by the citizens of Crested Butte, can go to the company once we have a withdrawal. And the way the withdrawal works is it has to go through Congress, and then it's signed by the president. Um, I think no one uh, expected it to go necessarily fast. <laughs> um, there was maybe a glimmer that maybe we could get something done before the Obama administration left. But this is a really complicated issue. Because we have the historic acid mine drainage, because we're dealing with withdrawing um, mineral rights that are under forest service land, we're also dealing with some just straight up private land. It's really complicated. And so I think it, it's something that will definitely take time. And right now, because we have everyone at the table that needs to be at the table to solve it, it we can. It's just taking time, making sure it's done right, and we end up with a final result that works for everyone long term. I had a feeling Lauren would have a question. <laughs> a question for Sam. Uh, actually, it was at the convention you referenced there at the end with Jackson, so it was interesting. But um, I was wondering if you had a thought as to whether or not continued decentralization and democratization of the grid right, is his best approach from a grassroots perspective, or uh, more of a top-down policy mechanism, or both? I, right, I, don't, I don't know what the answer is. Well, I would say all of the above. Um, there is definitely a group of people organizing statewide to begin looking at the deregulation piece of that. Um, there's a technology piece, because as battery storage gets more and more available, then you can migrate it down from grid storage down to neighborhood storage down to home storage even. But that neighborhood storage is what's so important for being able to make areas robust to lots of distributed generation. So I think there's a lot of answers, but I think you'll see the grassroots trying to come forward with some regulatory proposals over the next year or two. Cat-like. <laughs> This one's also for you. Um, I was wondering if you knew how Excel managed to construct our state's largest coal-fired generator after these renewable platform or renewable portfolio standards were implemented. 
and uh, what can be done to prevent any more of that from happening? Yeah, I don't think you'll ever see that again. Um, <clears throat> that, that whole mess was Comanche 3, right? And so I can't remember when it got permitted, but like 02 or 03, something like that, it got completed in 07 or 08. I, I can't remember the dates exactly. But I think you were seeing Excel taking advantage of the very last opportunity it was ever gonna have to build a big central station power plant again. And I don't know that they actually knew what was coming. I just know that they got a special dispensation from the legislature, again, to own that. So rather than being bid in as competitive generation as you would expect it to, the legislature um, declared that Excel would have the ability to go to the PUC for the proceedings that got us Comanche 3. So, you know, it was the same kind of thing. It was a deal, right? Except this deal was bad in both ways um, for everybody except Excel. Um, and yeah, I mean, that will be the conversation. It's Comanche 3 where the stranded assets will be the greatest, and that's where the conversation is most difficult, and that's why having the, the two PUC people, the former PUC members helping put this deal together with the wind to shut down the coal is pretty important. We have time for one more question. Hello. Uh, my question is for Zane. Uh, you showed the video at the beginning of the um, segment when you were speaking, and uh, you referenced that it was part of the culture of the community that you were showcasing in that video. And I'm just wondering uh, what work your coalition does with the indigenous communities that are native to this area, and how they fit into part of like the community and the heritage of this area, and like, what it is that um, they are doing, or how it is that you guys are reaching out to them to draw them in for the fight as well. Yeah. Um, so we've done some outreach. There's very, there's not a large indigenous community in Garfield or Pickens counties. Um, we've done some. We've had conversations with some of the organizations in the Four Corners um, region, and beyond that, it's it's been a come one come all approach to conserving these lands. We did highlight um, through some help with some folks. I'm spacing on their name right now, but some archeological resources that were in the Divide Creek side of the Thompson Divide and used those resources and the evidence of those resources within the NEPA process, um, which also gave, um, gave standing to indigenous communities within the NEPA process. Um, and again, building, or building towards a record for conserving the area. So I hope that helps. Imagine if you went to all these talks and it didn't show up for action. <laughs> Just imagine.